My name is Representative Jamila Taylor from the 30th District in South King County, centered around Federal Way, Auburn, uh, Pacific, Algona, parts of unincorporated King County, and parts of Des Moines. I am honored to be here tonight. I am the Civil Rights and Judiciary Chair in the Washington State Legislature and former Vice Chair of the Housing uh, Committee, uh, also serving in many other leadership capacities, representing the great state of Washington and making sure that Washingtonians are part of our future in a different way that we, than what we've had in the past. And I'm so honored to be here to introduce our keynote tonight. Dr. James Gregory is a professor of history and former Harry Bridges Endowed Chair of Labor Studies here at the University of Washington. Professor Gregory's prize-winning books and many articles fo focus on American labor, civil rights, and migration history, as well as the Pacific Northwest. His book, The Southern Diaspora, How the Great Migrations of Black and White Southerners Transformed America, published in 2005, won the Philip Taft Labor History Book Award. His book, American Exodus, The Dust Bowl Migration and Oki Culture in California, published in 1989, also won two major book prizes. Dr. Gregory has been researching the history of segregation in Seattle and Washington State since 2005. Yes. Segregation, specifically racial segregation, was part of the political and socioeconomic DNA of Washington State. In addition to his research and teaching duties, Dr. Gregory is the director of the Racial Restrictive Covenants Project, which is part of the Civil Rights and Labor History Consortium here at the University of Washington. The 14 projects bring together more than 100 video oral history interviews, several thousand photographs, documents, and digitized newspaper articles, included our films, slideshows, lesson plans for teachers. This project also features scores of historical essays about important e issues, events, and people, many researched and written by undergraduate and graduate students at the University of Washington. In 2021, the state allocated funds under the House Bill 1335 to establish the Racial Covenants Project, which is part of this consortium. It's a project endeavor between University of Washington and Eastern Washington U University. And as part of that research, to date, more than 50,000 racially restrictive covenants have been identified in counties throughout Washington by more than 1,000 volunteers. As a follow-up to House Bill 1335, I was the prime sponsor for House Bill 1474, the Co Covenant Home Ownership Act, which provides down payment assistance to the Washington residents or the descendants who would have been harmed by racially restrictive covenants. This means black folks, Latino folks, Asian Americans, <coughs> other immigrants, indigenous folks, and Jewish people. Let me repeat, also their descendants. With the advocacy led by the Black Homeownership Initiative, a multiracial coalition of more than 100 organizations, they vigorously advocated the lecture, the legislature to ensure this bill was, became a law. The Covenant Homeownership Act is the first in the nation of its kind, with many states looking to follow our lead. Supporting and amplifying Dr. Gregory's work and his efforts to uncom uncover these uncomfortable truths is among the many steps where we, where we as a community can meet the moment. History is now, and our collective journey matters. We can act with a shared responsibility to see the arc of justice become reality to build a future that prioritizes shared prosperity and a more inclusive economic system. And I am here for it. <laughs> Tonight, 
we will learn the details of why this research matters and that we must remain committed to righting the wrongs of the past. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Gregory. Wow, thank you. That was too much. And, and let me express the gratitude in a different way. Representative Taylor is in the midst of a legislative session and has spent the last month going back and forth between Federal Way and Olympia and agreed to come all the way up here tonight to be with us. And that is such a gift. And you're gonna hear more from her. I'm gonna talk about history, and then we're gonna talk about this amazing new law, which is going into effect very soon, and Representative Taylor is gonna join me to talk about that. So, first a little history, or actually, no, let's not do history, let's talk about this. So, you've been looking at it, I think, I hope. I have to get rid of that. And um, this is an amazing image produced by Marissa Rowell. You see her name there. Uh, it appeared in an article about the Racial Restrictive Covenants Project that was published by the College of Arts and Sciences in the, in the Perspective magazine. And then Marissa Rowell uh, allowed us to use this on our website. And you can see the URL if you want to follow up with any of that. But I want to take a close look here. What's going on? Who are these people and what do they represent? They seem to be a family from the It's a Wonderful World era of American history, the 1950s and 1960s. A wonderful world of plentiful jobs, homes for nearly everyone, as long as you look like them an era when homes were subsidized by low interest, low down payment loans from the federal government. This was a golden age of expanded home ownership as long as you looked like them. Now think about the blinders as they walk through this world that's wonderful only for people like them and wonderful because they live in a racially restricted residential community. The blinders resonate for me in two ways. First, because I once looked like that little boy and was as ignorant as the blinders suggest for this family. Second, it reminds me of my early impressions of Seattle. I began my career as a historian in California and then moved to the University of Washington almost exactly 30 years ago, it seems like yesterday. And I fell in love with this place immediately, almost immediately. There was that sort of dark winter thing that was hard on Californians. I also had trouble with the smug and ignorant parts of Seattle culture. Too many people were blind to racial inequalities, past and present. They wanted to believe that white supremacy and segregation were problems of the South, not Seattle. Hoping to do something about this ignorance problem, I co-founded the Seattle Civil Rights and Labor History Project, an online resource for examining our history of civil rights movements and the struggles for equality. The goal was to shrink some of the blinders around here. That's also one of the goals of this talk. The other is to share observations about Seattle that differentiate our city from many others. The subtitle of this series, the whole series, is Building and Belonging. Josh Reed's wonderful talk was about Coast Salish peoples and the urgent and creative ways that they held on to their homes to continue to belong. The other talks in various ways emphasized migration, 
and the building of a demographically diverse city. John Finley introduced the theme and explored the <coughs> complications of changing citizenship laws. Devon Nahr showed us how Sephardic Jews created here the second largest concentration in the United States. Yelena Campbell explored the special link between Russia and Seattle. I'm changing the subject, or actually kind of reversing it. Who was not allowed to build and belong? My talk is about exclusion, about ways this region unwelcomed people, and it focuses on housing, because housing policies by government, state, county, and city were used for more than 130 years to keep people out, people who did not look like me, to make sure that they did not belong. My talk is also intended to introduce a question that's often quietly asked. Why is Washington one of the whitest states? Why, until recently, was Seattle one of the whitest cities? In the last 30 years, the demographics have changed, but the small number of African Americans is still striking. At only 5% statewide, we fall behind Nebraska, Iowa, Colorado, Arizona, and 33 other states. Why? As Representative Taylor mentioned, I wrote a book some years back about the great migration of African Americans out of the South. And in that book, I puzzled why, why did black folks from the South go to some cities, some areas, and not others? Migration scholars usually think only about incentives. Are there job opportunities? That's what caused people to move. But it's also important to consider obstacles. In this talk, I want to emphasize the mechanisms of exclusion, especially housing. Until recently, I, like most historians of racial inequality, focused on the issue of segregation. Here's one of a sequence of maps that we publish on the project website to show Seattle's segregation and desegregation story. The maps on the left show African-American densities, the one on the right, Asian-Americans. So here's 1950. Both populations were tightly contained in the Central District, in what was then and for a while called the L-shaped ghetto. Here's a closer look at that L shape. So this is an area um, that follows 23rd Avenue between Madison and Dearborn, and then follows Jackson and Yesler moving west towards uh, Pioneer Square. As Devon Nahr mentioned, Sephardic and Ashkenazic Jews had also lived in that area before World War II but by 1950 are moving out. Here's 1960. No change really for black folks, just more people in the containment area. Japanese Americans are beginning to find homes on Beacon Hill. 1970, not much change. Japanese, Chinese, and Filipino Americans now live mostly on Beacon Hill. Um, and here's a closer look at the L-shaped ghetto showing African Americans. So in some of these census tracts, more than 90% of all residents are black. 1980, laws banning housing discrimination are beginning to matter. Black people are breaking containment and moving south. Changes in immigration law are now allowing new immigrants from Asia, and those communities are also spreading south. 1990, things are changing. Immigration is bringing lots of people from Asia and Latin America. Asian origin people now outnumber African Americans, and the meaning of that category, Asian American, is changing. Japanese Americans are no longer the largest component, 
as Chinese, Korean, Vietnamese, and Asian Indian populations increase. I haven't shown Latinos in previous maps because the population was small. Now, in 1990, there are 44,000 Latinos in King County. Now let's jump 30 years to 2020, our most recent counts. And here we see dramatic changes of several kinds. Microsoft and other tech companies and their hiring practices are encouraging lots of migration from uh, China, India, and other Asian nations. And the Asian American population has quadrupled since 1990. And people, as you can see, are living nearly everywhere. Latino numbers have increased fivefold, and that population is settling mostly in South King County and South Seattle. Here's what's happening to black people. The numbers have increased. They've actually doubled, but not at the same rate as other um, communities of color. And spatially, the changes are different, too. The map over here shows this big move to the south, southeast Seattle, South King County, Representative Taylor's district down there. But look what's happening in the central district. Gentrification is literally pushing people out of the CD. The map, the densities above in 1970, some of those census tracts were 90% black. And by 2020, they're 90% not black. Some of this movement is voluntary. A lot of it has to do with rising rents, forcing people out. So that's sort of the segregation, desegregation story. And these maps are very important and revealing, but I've come to see that the focus on segregation misses a bigger issue. For generations, black and Asian people were simply kept away. Cities, counties, and the state government enacted policies of racial exclusion. What's the difference? Segregation, exclusion. Segregation systems mandate separate spaces on the basis of race. Exclusion grants no space or minimal space. Exclusion policies aim to keep certain people out, to preserve space for whites only. This map demonstrates the effects of exclusion as of 1970. Look at the white spaces here. Black folks were not allowed to live in North Seattle or on the east side in 1970. If you can see the actual numbers here, those aren't percents. That's the total number of African Americans living in these census tracts of about four to 5,000 people. Some of these areas have zero or one or two African Americans, only six Black Americans resided in Bothell, handful in Kirkland and Bellevue. And here I've kind of pumped up the numbers so that you can actually see them. You've heard the term sundown town? Yeah, I hope so. These were places where black people were supposed to be gone by sunset. They could work there as domestic servants or something, but then they had to go. Although we haven't found official declarations to that effect, it's clear that many East Side and North County areas operated as sundown zones with the help of law enforcement. And that seems to describe the whole county, Snohomish County. Black and Asian people simply were not allowed to live there as late as 1970. Only 1,000 African Americans and less than 1,000 Asian Americans resided in the entire county. And the one census tract where numbers were not tiny is Monroe Penitentiary. Why were black and Asian people not living in these areas? Was it a matter of choice? 
Was it because there were no jobs? Absolutely not. These areas practiced intense housing exclusion backed up by threats and violence. It was too difficult and too dangerous to rent or buy in these all-white areas. I'm going to demonstrate the mechanics of this form of exclusion and show how it interacts with our history of migration and population growth. Migration. That should be our middle name. As John Finley explained, Washington has been a population magnet since the 1850s, with boosters and businesses constantly trying to attract newcomers and developers racing to subdivide land and build housing. Migration has been the Washington story for 170 years, and I think the number's just passed 8 million uh, in the last month or so. But not everyone has been welcome, and housing policy has been one of the most important ways that the region has enforced exclusion. Even when jobs were available, it was difficult to come here and stay here because of housing and property restrictions. Josh Reed talked about land issues in detail, and I want to repeat a little in order to clarify how land ownership works and why today some people own so much landed property, others some, and many none. In 1785, two years before the Constitution was adopted, the brand new United States introduced a system of property rights that was unique at that time granting perpetual and irreversible ownership to property distributed by the federal government. Most European nations at that time made land ownership conditional, subject to rulers who could revoke ownership. Land titles under the Land Ordinance of 1785 conveyed unconditional and perpetual ownership, meaning that those initially privileged could benefit from and pass it on and sell and do whatever they wanted. That was one aspect of the US property system. The other was the presumption that vast lands of the continent could and should be taken from indigenous peoples to be redistributed by the federal government to white settlers, settler colonialism, awarding full and permanent title, turning open lands as they were understood by indigenous peoples into privately owned land. That was the system in place in 1851 when the Denny Party claimed huge tracts of land around Elliott Bay. And in 1855, when Governor Isaac Stevens coerced the Puget Sound peoples into giving up most of their lands. And this map from 1876 is showing what lands were and lost in those treaties. The Territorial Land Office then began to distribute it to white settlers, who as first owners established the chain of title of ownership. Everyone in this room who owns a house or land traces their claim of ownership, their right to that property, back to these original land distributions. In the decades that followed, local and state governments established additional rules governing use and access, and racial exclusion was the goal at various stages. In 1865, the Seattle Council passed an ordinance declaring it unlawful for Indians to reside in town. You can see the ordinance here. Seattle was not yet a municipality, and the ordinance was dropped when it became a city in 1869, probably because Henry Yesler and the other mill owners argued that their Coast Salish workers were vital to their business. But the 1865 ordinance signified something more lasting. It was the first in a long line of policies and practices that governments in the region would establish to exclude anyone who was not white. Chinese people were the next victims. 
several thousand Chinese had come to the territory in the 1870s to work on railroad construction and in mining and timber camps. In 1885, white workers organized driving out campaigns throughout the West. Near Issaquah, three Chinese were killed and six wounded in an attack. Another attack drove Chinese workers out of the Black Diamond and Newcastle coal towns. The mayor of Tacoma then led a mob, and you can see the poster here, attacking that city's Chinese district. Seattle was next. In three days of violence, nearly the entire population of Chinese were forced to flee. Five years later, gunfire and mob violence were used against black coal miners at Franklin and Newcastle. Here's an article from a Seattle newspaper spreading the fear of the black train headed for King County. These are examples of how job opportunities could attract workers of color while organized campaigns of white workers made life untenable in Washington State. Meanwhile, as shown on these maps, Seattle was beginning the population boom that John Finley detailed, attracting more than 200,000 newcomers in the two decades following 1890. They came from many states and many European countries. There's a list of those where people were born, and you'll see on that list that only 20% of the state's population was actually born in Washington, and they're almost all children. Virtually all adults had come from somewhere else, and that somewhere else was either Europe or the United States. They're virtually all white. Japanese immigrants were the exception in this time period, and they faced the same kind of hostility that had greeted Chinese immigrants. But now the tools of exclusion were changing, as local and state governments created laws and instruments to control access to housing and property. This page from the Seattle Star in 1919 endorses the campaign launched by Miller Freeman, who declared, this is white man's country. Freeman, that's a name people in Bellevue will know because of the Freeman real estate empire, uh, which he started, Freeman was particularly focused on Japanese families who had secured land for farming. Japanese farmers grew berries, vegetables, uh, uh, and other crops in Bellevue, Renton, Kent Valley, and Bainbridge Island. They managed to lease or buy land despite the state's alien land law, a measure that had been added to the state constitution in 1889 aimed at Chinese people. The law banned ownership of land by aliens, but here's the important quote, aliens other than those who in good faith have declared their intention to become citizens of the United States. This was cleverly worded to allow European immigrants to own land while barring Asian immigrants because, Asian, because only white immigrants could apply for citizenship. When Japanese families found loopholes in the original version, the legislature passed new alien land laws in 1921 and 1924. By the end of the 1920s, the number of farms in Japanese hands statewide had fallen 65%, although some were able to work under contract for the new white owners. Whole communities were lost, especially on the east side where Miller Freeman crowed, quote, the people of this country never invited you here. You were not welcome. You've created an abnormal situation in our midst for which you are to blame. Do you know when those laws were repealed? The 50s. The 50s, no. So the JACL, Japanese American Citizens League, after World War II began campaigns to get rid of these racist laws. And twice they managed to persuade lawmakers to put measures on the ballot to repeal the law. In 1960, that ballot measure failed. 
1962, it failed. It's not until 1966 that this state could come around to repealing the alien land laws. It wasn't easy for Asians or African Americans to live in the city either. Here we see Seattle's 1920 tiny non-white populations and where they were forced to live. An overcrowded area of boarding houses, residential hotels, and apartments that was much later bulldozed and repurposed. So this inset map shows you approximately where if you see the Japanese population, the largest there, this is what that area is now. It was later bulldozed, freeways, and, um, and industrial uh, area now, <clears throat> apart from what's left of Chinatown and Neonmachi. Um, Chinese and Japanese people shared this area with Filipinos and some of the city's black population. The black population had grown slowly and numbered less than 3,000 in 1920. Some people had moved short distances from coal towns that had been the focus of violence. Others arrived from the Midwest. This was not the great migration out of the South that delivered hundreds of thousands of people from the Cotton Belt to the big cities of the Northeast and Midwest. African Americans came to Washington in small numbers and often didn't stay. Job opportunities were the lure. Some employers were w interested in black workers, in part to undermine the powerful unions in the area, unions that were only open to whites. That hostility was an obstacle, so was the problem of housing. Unlike the Midwestern and Eastern cities that attracted black Southerners in this period in and around World War I, Seattle did not have an established black neighborhood where newcomers could find housing. Instead, they competed for scarce rentals in the Asian district and, and in lodging houses in the Skid Row Pioneer Square area. But there was one possibility for those with resources. William Gross, seen here, had purchased 12 acres from Henry Yesler in 1882. 12 acres that now surround the intersection of Madison and 23rd. Gross was one of the first black residents of Washington and a successful entrepreneur. His land purchase would become important to the subsequent, subsequent growth of black Seattle. In the following decades, his son sold lots to black professionals and merchants who built houses and established a tiny middle, black middle class neighborhood. That's the Gross House built in the 1890s. I think it was destroyed 20, 30 years ago. It's no longer there, as far as I can tell. This story illustrates a key housing challenge for, for the black community. Whites and Asians were unlikely to rent to black folks. Black entrepreneurs were going to have to buy or build much of the housing the community would need. And for a population without initial wealth, that was a problem. Starting in the 1920s, there were new challenges. New governments supplied tools of ex exclusion. Zoning ordinance, ordinance, for one thing. In 1923, Seattle adopted its first zoning plan. The idea was to keep pure residential neighborhoods separated from industrial and mixed use areas. There was no mention of race in the 1923 plan, but the new designation of single family residential areas would, would support exclusion in other ways. Now I want to turn to the research that we've done in the past three years with the support of the legislature, the HB 1335 that Representative Taylor mentioned. Uh, it's been about two and a half years and some of the people who work with me on this project are here. Um, we are charged with identifying the hundreds of neighborhoods throughout Western Washington 
and the Eastern Washington, EWT is doing Eastern Washington, the hundreds of neighborhoods where racially restrictive covenants prevented people of color and sometimes Jews from buying, but also from renting or even occupying housing. Restrictive covenants are documents recorded at the county recorder's office. They're recorded by property owners and they legally bind them and more important, future owners not to sell, not to lease, not to rent their property to specified racial or religious groups. There's an example, there are a couple there. Here's one you can read. <clears throat> no person or persons of Asiatic or African blood or lineage or extraction shall be permitted to occupy a portion of said property or any building thereon, except domestic servant or servants who may be employed in good faith by white occupants of said premises. To date, our project has identified more than 50,000 restricted properties in the Puget Sound region and the Eastern Washington folks are adding to that. This includes 34,000, Sophia Dowling, the project coordinator is here and she said, actually, I think we're about 37,000. But anyway, at least 34,000 in King County, 4,000 in Snohomish County, 5,000 in Pierce County and the other counties, uh, several thousand apiece. And you can see maps like this and Liz Peng who's here and designs all these cool maps would be very happy if you uh, would do that. Um, so here's another type of map we produced that is zeroing in on the actual subdivisions. The other maps will show properties and you can look up addresses, but uh, this kind of map uh, is focusing on subdivisions and providing information about who the developer is and, and when it was developed and other things. Um, as you can see on the right, the, the language of restriction varies. Some, many, maybe most, simply say whites or Caucasians only. But others itemize banned populations, and the language is offensive and confusing. Deeds to property in the Broadmoor neighborhood on the other side of Montlake can read, quote, no part of said property hereby conveyed shall ever be used or occupied by any Hebrew or by any person of the Ethiopian, Malay, or Asiatic race. Hebrew meant Jews. Ethiopian meant all Africans, not just Ethiopians. Malay meant Filipinos. And here's one that's truly eye-opening. The man who sold a small group of properties in Clyde Hill restricted it to members of the Aryan race, invoking Hitler's racial categories. And what's worse, he added this restriction in 1946 and 1947. Whoa. Hitler was dead. Nazi crimes and the Holocaust were well known. In fact, the Nuremberg trials and executions had been worldwide news. 1947. So who started this? Covenants were largely the work of real estate professionals. The National Association of Realtors campaigned for deed restrictions starting in the 1920s. In 1926, the Supreme Court, the US Supreme Court, ruled that covenants were legal and enforceable. And after that decision, it's off to the races in, in the, by the real estate industry. Here's Article 14 of the Association's Code of Ethics. Realtors could lose membership and access to listings if they helped a person of color move into a white neighborhood. That remained in effect until 1950. It wasn't until the 1970s that the association adopted a statement against racial discrimination. In 
The term redlining is often used these days to cover all sorts of segregation practices or as a synonym for segregation. But it actually refers to lending practices by banks and mortgage companies. The term redlining emerged in the 1930s when the federal government's Home Owners Loan Corporation and the Federal Housing Administration, the FHA, were established. The Roosevelt administration was trying to address a housing crisis. Millions of homes had been lost to foreclosure in the Great Depression, and banks were not offering mortgages or loans. HOLC produced maps for lenders to mark neighborhoods considered safe or hazardous for mortgage lending. Racially mixed neighborhoods were always coded red, hence the term redlining. Meanwhile, the FHA invented the 30-year amortized mortgage and proceeded over the next two, three decades to expand homeownership. But all that was sharply racialized. FHA guidelines expressly advocated restrictive covenants. So I thought I'd highlight some of the companies and individuals who were responsible for restricting huge swaths of the region, starting with the Puget Mill Company, also known as Pope and Talbot, also known as Walker Ames. You're laughing. Why are we laughing? Some of us just attended a reception upstairs in the Walker Ames room, and others of you at other times. And maybe you've been invited to the University of Washington President's Mansion, otherwise known as the Walker Ames Mansion. So, Edwin Ames ran Puget Mill Company, and before him, Cyrus Walker, and Puget Mill Company was responsible for subdividing enormous tracts of land, especially around Lake Washington and then up into Snohomish County. Ever heard of Alderwood or Linwood? That was Puget Sound Mill Company at one point. They didn't restrict all of it, but they restricted a lot of it, including Broadmoor here. Some of you know, may know where that is, Madison uh, Valley. Um, yeah, there's the restriction for Broadmoor. No part of said property hereby conveyed shall ever be used or occupied by any Hebrew or by any person of the Ethiopian, Malay, or Asiatic race. I think we had actually read that before. Um, so, okay, how about, how about the Coleman Company? So J.M. Coleman Company was one of the most venerable companies in Seattle. They had built Col the Coleman Docks, now the ferry terminal, um, and many real estate projects. In the 1920s, the company bought 90 acres north of Laurelhurst. But the Great Depression stalled activity until the mid-1930s when the company subdivided Windermere into 304 parcels, restricting them to persons of the, quote, white and gentile race. Then something interesting happened. Voters had recently elected a progressive city council, and two of the new city council members took action when the Coleman Company tried to record a plat for Windermere. A plat is a document showing streets and property lines. Without it, the city won't take responsibility for maintaining the streets uh, and sewers and the like. Um, and as you can see, the city council rejected the plan. But Windermere, the Coleman Company, went ahead with development, maintaining its restrictions. In 1926 and 27, William and Bertha Boeing purchased vast tracts of land in northwest Seattle and Shoreline, planning to subdivide and develop them. The first of them called Blue Ridge. The economic crisis interrupted things until 1935, with sales picking up in the 1940s. Altogether, the Boeing sold almost 1,000 homes and parcels with the whites-only restriction. Here's another familiar name, 
The founder of the John L. Scott Realty Company was an active restrictor, urging property owners to add language to their deeds. In 1960, he also played a prominent role in trying to keep the Henry family from moving into the Uplands neighborhood near Seward Park. A KUOW report, you see this, um, recently told the story. Dr. Henry was a cardiologist who bought property with the help of a white friend and built a house in the Uplands. When John L. Scott learned that a black family might soon become neighbors, he led a campaign to keep them out and, and eventually personally offered to buy out the, the Henry's financial investment. The offer was rejected. I do want to update this. The Scots' heirs later apologized for this and other actions undertaken by the company. The Great Migration finally reached Seattle during World War II. The term, I think I've already said, refers to the migration of black folks out of the South that had been very consequential for cities in the Northwest and uh, Midwest and Northeast starting 25 years earlier. Housing problems had deflected interest away from Seattle, but as defense industries called for workers in this region during the war, the story began to change. But housing remained an issue. Where would you live? A tragic opportunity opened when 7,000 Japanese American Seattle residents were shipped off to concentration camps. Black newcomers moved into their apartments. The Great Migration continued for several decades, bringing the black population to 27,000 in 1960, 38,000 in 1970. But these numbers would have been higher had housing been available. As you can see in this 1960 map, everyone was crammed into the central district. Here's Dorothy Hollingsworth describing her disappointment at finding that things in this area were little different than her, in her native North Carolina. Years later, after coming here, she would be elected to the Seattle School Board. Three months ago, her granddaughter, Joy Hollingsworth, was elected to the Seattle City Council. Let's see if I can get this to play. I expected that we would all be one here. And uh, when I saw this separatism, that kind of surprised me. But uh, I was surprised, but it didn't overwhelm me. For instance, I uh, went over to um, Port Orchard mm -hmm. one day with my husband who was buying some material over there. And it was hot. And I went in and asked, says, I'd like a Coke, please. And so the uh, manager of the little restaurant says, well, I can sell it to you, but you can't drink it in here. Now that, that to me was a bit much. So then I began to think, gee, you may be a long way from home, but the practice isn't so different. And here's Judge Charles Johnson describing the housing challenges. Actually shut down the schools, as far as African Americans was concerned, and created our own, own school to point out the fact that uh, the schools here was, was uh, segregated just like they were in the South. And they were. And of course, had a, housing patterns created a great deal of this because all the blacks were stayed in a confined area in the Central District. And we were people who actually had come here, were doing well, engineers, school teachers, and others, couldn't buy a house outside of the Central area. And there was nice homes everywhere. And they were having trouble getting into houses. And we had, were using subterfuges to get people in the house, had white people buying houses, selling them back to black. All of this was going on. You didn't have to try and convince people that, was a pro that, were, that were problems. They could see them. They couldn't do what everybody else was doing here. Those who, uh, uh, African Americans here, couldn't get a house where they wanted to get a house. They 
had trouble getting jobs like other people, even though they were qualified for these jobs. They, the children were, had to go to schools in the, um, the, the, the segregated schools because they were primarily segregated at that time. And uh, if you found a school that had what you considered a better education and, and, uh, uh, than the schools in the central area, because the schools in the central area did measure up with schools outside of the central area, you couldn't have your child go there even if you could take the child over there every day to go. So you didn't have to get people a hard time getting people. You didn't have a hard time getting people to become involved because this was affecting their way of life here on a daily basis. What, what role? So let's uh, clarify the, the legal standing of racial restrictions. Until 1948, they were fully enforceable in courts of law, and a property owner who decided to sell to a person of color could be held liable for damages and the sale voided. In 1948, the Supreme Court changed its mind and ruled that state courts should not be responsible for enforcement. The ruling did very little. Restrictions remained fully legal, and new ones were added over the next 20 years. And all along, court cases had been rare. Restrictions were enforced in other ways, by real estate professionals refusing to show properties, as you heard here, by hostile neighbors who made it really difficult, as in the case of the Henrys, to move into a white neighborhood. In the 1950s and 60s, civil rights activists conducted, try, uh, conducted campaigns trying in various ways to break the cycle of housing restrictions. In 1964, they secured a ballot measure in Seattle that would have established an open housing law something that had already been done in about 60 cities. Seattle voters rejected it by a margin of two to one. And you can see here a newspaper ad produced by the real estate interests urging a no vote and claiming that the law would limit property rights. Now the irony, which these people didn't get, is that restrictive covenants already limited property rights, preventing owners from selling to whomever they wanted. Finally, in 1968, in the months after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., Congress passed the Fair Housing Act, making discrimination illegal, and Seattle passed a similar law. I want to say a little more about acts of resistance prior to the 1968 change in law. Brave families all along had taken risks to find housing outside the tight central district ghetto. And sometimes they paid a steep price. In 1941, as job opportunities lured African Americans to the region while housing scarcity made life difficult, a teacher and civil rights activist, Carl Brooks and his family, managed to move into a modest home in Shoreline only to face a campaign of terror that culminated in a bombing that endangered the lives of their children. This newspaper report is, is in a left-wing weekly, uh, the New Dealer it was called, uh, is interesting in t for two reasons. First, they note that none of the mainstream newspapers have reported the incident. The fact that this explicit act of racially motivated terror was ignored by major media indicates how pervasive the consensus was in institutions of power that segregation should be uh, enforced. Second, the article reports that the county sheriff had known about and, quote, not disapproved of the intim intimidation campaign up to the time of the bombing. This is an indication that the sheriff's office was involved in sundown town enforcements in the unincorporated sections of King County. Kent was another sundown area, which a few families tried to open in 1964. They were greeted with bombs and shotguns. In 
I hope these stories clarify that violent white supremacist attacks were not limited to the South. The murderous violence organized by the Klan in Mississippi and other states in the early 1960s was more deadly, but this was also scary and serious. And it wasn't just Kent. Here's a nearby example, very nearby. A mixed race couple, Ray and Marion West, were active in civil rights campaigns. In 1952, they bought a boarding house just a few blocks from here uh, with the intention of renting rooms to black students who otherwise couldn't live near the university. They endured years of harassment, culminating in a cross burning in 1958. Worried about their children's safety, they gave up and moved to the Central District. Here's Marion West. Thrown at us at times, and we uh, got firecrackers thrown into the house, and even a cross burned in our yard at one time. Uh, we called the authorities when that happened, and they came out, and the police came out and got the cross, which was a great big thing, and uh, it was burned in the night next to the room where my children were sleeping, and it really, we, we were on the other side of the house, so we didn't know it. It was really scary afterwards when we found out about it. Mm. And did anybody step forward to take credit for it? No. Uh, what was the police response? Nothing more than the fact that they took it. They didn't investigate? I don't know. If they did, they never came by our place to tell us anything. Okay, so we've just been going through a lot of history here. Enough of the history. Is this just history? The laws changed in 1968. Restrictive covenants are no longer legal. Why should we care? Does this history matter? Yes, yes, emphatically yes. And I want to show you some of the reasons why. It has to do with home ownership. Restrictions suppressed home ownership and wealth building opportunities for Americans of color who were locked out of most neighborhoods and secondly had trouble obtaining loans because of redlining all through the post-war decades. This is the area when federal subsidies are helping most white families become homeowners. As restrictions eased in the decades since the 70s, it was too late. Rising prices then became an enormous obstacle. And that's why families of color are less likely to own homes and their homes are worth less on average than white families who've been accumulating real estate wealth for generations. So here's some data. I know you like charts. Everybody likes charts, right? I, I really like charts. I do data. So here we go. Historians doing data. These are home ownership rates by race each decade since 1970. The blue uh, line, blue area represents black home ownership, red is white, green is Latino, and lavender is Asian Americans. And you can see here, well, if you look at the far right, you see how bad things are. 62% of white families in this county are homeowners, compared to only 28% of black families. 28%. That is so much lower than the national average, 44%, which is already, of course, much lower than white national average, but so much lower. And it's nearly the lowest in any city in the country. I think Minneapolis is slightly lower. Otherwise, even cities with very expensive housing, Washington, D.C., New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, do better than Seattle on this. And you can see the other disturbing part, the trend line. 
1970, 50% of African American households owned homes, now 28%. It's declined decade after decade. Why? Well, home equity and price escalation have a lot to do with this. So here are median prices or values by race and decade. Again, blue is black, red is white. And you can see in every decade, the homes owned by black, Latino families in King County are consistently worth less than those owned by whites, only 75% in the most recent account. So this fact, adding to the problem that began of suppressing home ownership, helps explain the declining home ownership rates for black families. You have to look at that trend line here, the exponential increase in the price of homes since 1970. It's rocketed up. In 2022, the median home value, this is across all races, the median home value in King County was 35 times what it had been in 1970. Median home value of 790,000 versus 22,500 50 years earlier. That's a 3,500% increase. This far exceeds inflation and or the rate of increase in family incomes. The rate of increase in family incomes across these five decades is about 10 to one, about 1,000%, as opposed to 3,500%. So how does that work? A family selling a full-valued home can take advantage of this rocketing market, exchanging one house for another or dispersing the housing assets through inheritance. But a family trying to buy for the first time in the post-covenant restriction decades and those selling undervalued homes needed much higher incomes to buy property. The point is that in the last three decades, buyers have needed wealth to get started. Wealth in the form of inheritance or high paying jobs. Highly paid business and professional class migrants from California, New York, here's the California one, uh, from California, New York, and across the Pacific have been able to join this pricey housing market. While those with average incomes and without family property wealth have lost out. The enormous disadvantage that black families face in King County is made clearer when we consider income, as this chart does. So here, black in blue, red. We're looking at different income categories. And in every single one, black homeownership is less than white. For families earning more than 150,000, the differential is about you know, 9%. But look how the differential increases. 20% lower for, the, for some of these categories. And when you get to modest incomes, imagine trying to buy a house with a modest income. Ah, impossible. But quite a few white families own homes, even though their income is in the fifty to $75,000 range, or even under 50000 But if you're under 50000 how do you explain that 38% family wealth? That's inheritance. That's multi-generational home transfers, and with it, wealth transfer. That's the only way people with modest incomes can own homes, and African Americans have not had that family wealth because they were shut out of the housing market in the critical early phase. Okay, how about some good news? <laughs> Last year, the legislature passed a pioneering law 
written and sponsored by Representative Taylor, along with Representative Frank Chop and State Senator John Lovick. It's a first in the nation effort to provide financial compensation to the victims of generations of government-sponsored housing discrimination. It takes effect in a few months, and it should do some really good things for housing opportunities here. Representative Taylor, would you come up here and help us, help me? So, I think that's on, and I think we have to stand apart. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> All right. so I, but I have another slide okay. I wanted to click first. So this is Governor Inslee signing the bill, and to his immediate right, as you're seeing, is uh, the sponsor, the person who, you know, made this all possible. And so, um, well, do you have any thoughts about what this law is going to do? Uh, yeah, I, I think what's important about this law and what's unique about it is that we shape it in the form of a tort claim. So if you were a person who was present in the state of Washington, present, present, um, that means, uh, and you were subjected to those racially restrictive covenants in 1968, um, you would be eligible for this program if you meet the qualifications. But what makes it reparative justice reparative justice, is that we are including our, their descendants. So if I'm a Washingtonian who can say, I'm a descendant of William Gross, even though I wasn't born until 1975, I'd be eligible for this program. Um, in fact, my family didn't arrive into Washington State until after 1968, so I, I specifically am not eligible for the program. So it's a first step in trying to figure out how to address these harms that were state-sponsored. They were intentional, and they had generational impact um, on Washingtonians. And, and trying to make sure that our colleagues understood, one, there were black folks in Washington State before 1968. In fact, we were part of the initiation of the entire state. Um, we had an African-American who was part of the first um, legislature in 1889. And then also figuring out how to reach the communities that were most impacted by this um, legislature. So many people are excited about this effort, but also say that we don't go far enough. And that just means that we have more work to do and other ways to do this reparative justice. And um, so if I recall correctly, the law specifically says that the state of Washington caused the harm. So it's a harm based, it's not just it is very specific, and what's unique about the way we've drafted this, we're, we are looking at racially restrictive covenants. We didn't have enslavement in Washington State, so when people are thinking about reparations and the folks who are African descendant of enslaved people, we are going specifically to something that we can identify of a harm in Washington State. Yeah. Direct harm. And then, uh, do I have this correct? Um, the Covenant Home Ownership Program mm -hmm. will provide mortgage assistance in the form of no interest down payment loans uh, to first time home buyers with incomes below the area median who were victims yes. of property exclusion mm -hmm. before 1968 including their descendants. Including their descendants. And, and one of the ways that we are looking at how do you establish that, we're, we're looking at genealogical accepted uh, standards. So if, if you can show that your you know, grandfather worked for Boeing in 1948, that's proof. If you can show birth certificates, if you can show um, lease agreements, not that many people have lease agreements because, you know, rent, um, then there's ways that you can show you know, how your family is connected. And, it, and it's 
anyone who would have been subjected to those racially restrictive covenants. So it's not just black folks, even though black folks were excluded in all of the racially restrictive covenants, but in some areas, um, you know, Latinos, indigenous, indigenous people, uh, Asians, um, and other folks who were also uh, discriminated against. And, and it was very fascinating to watch the multiracial coalition come together on this with concerted effort. And we were surprised to get the realtors to support this because realtors do what realtors do. And some of the vestiges of their policies and their activism is alive and well today in terms of very similar rhetoric that you saw in the lecture. Yeah, but I was surprised during the hearings when the representative of the Washington realtors said, yeah. He said, it's time, right? Mm -hmm. We need to make amends. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, w how much money, or tell us about the financial parts of this. So this is funded by a document recording fee, and in Washington State, we already have one of the highest document recording fees um, uh, available in a real estate transaction. Um, so it goes from um, $150 to about $250 in a real estate transaction. So Washington, you're paying a house, um, buying a house for $400,000, that's $250 of that transaction is going towards um, the, the document recording fee, and $100 of that is helping to address um, this particular um, concern. So it, it establishes an account, yes. which will then fund these, and they're loans, right? They, they, they are loans that will be forgivable by our intent in the future. We haven't legislated for that, but there are ways to forgive loans, but also transfer the property to the next generation. So we, we don't wanna give this opportunity and then snatch it away when someone is attempting to um, let their you know, ch children um, uh, transfer the property to their children and they would lose the benefit of the equity that they would have received from the mortgage um, uh, down payment assistance. But if somebody, takes the loan and then sells the house, they have to pay back the loan. If they s sell the house outside of the, the qualifications, that part of the mortgage would probably be um, addressed. But we haven't gotten to that point yet. Right. <laughs> and are there any guesses about how many loans or how much money will be available? So we're working on a, a, a scheme that would allow us to determine that based on region and the size of the home and the types of mortgage um, uh, down payments that could be available. So for example, a home in Spokane, Washington, $500,000 may need 10% uh, down, that's $50,000. We designed it so that this would be a program that can stack on top of other down payment assistance programs and um, you know, ensuring that we, people have access to the market. Uh, again, you have to qualify for the, the mortgage, and so even with your modest income, we wanna make sure that you have access to purchasing a home in the communities that you really do wanna uh, live in, but also in the community that um, supports your um, desire to build intergenerational wealth and stability. Right. And, um I know that you and other attorneys who were drafting this legislation were doing so with one eye on the Supreme Court <laughs> that is abolishing anything that looks like affirmative action. Um, yeah, that's why this is shaped more like a tort claim. So if you can demonstrate, again, presence in the state um, and you're a part of the racially um, restricted, per protected um, individuals, then you would be qualified for this particular program. So we wanted to tie the, the reparative justice to the harm that was caused. Um, if there was another um, opportunity for us to do that in other areas like business development, we would find some way in, in that particular way to, to address it. But the fact that we see how the compounding impacts of these restrictions led to hostility of neighbors, hostility of being able to um, be in the community after a certain amount of time. I was today's years old when I found out that Kent was a sundown town. Today. I learned today about Kent. That is technically next to my district. And, and th these are things that are really critical for us to understand and, under, uh, and incorporating into how we make policies moving forward so that we're not layering 
new policies that actually continue to exacerbate the problems. Great. I think we should invite Professor Bianca Dang, who is tasked with asking us both questions. So. Oh. Now there will be three of us on here. I'll go over here. First of all, I want to say thank you so much, Representative Taylor. Thank you so much, Professor Gregory, for this amazing talk. Representative Taylor, when you said that you're working on uh, loan forgiveness with this, that just made my heart lift. Mm -hmm. And so thinking through the just creative ways that this is a continuing process is so inspiring. Um, so I, want, I guess that opens my first question while we wait for audience questions. Um, I really loved uh, Representative Taylor when you said this is thinking about history and thinking about where we as a community can meet the moment. Right, and thinking about this as part of that. And this made me think about um, uh, one of our colleagues in the real estate department, um, Greg Colburn, just published a book called Homelessness is a Housing Crisis, thinking about kind of not just Seattle, but Seattle is one of the case studies involved. And so this made me think, um, kind of, it, I came back to this when Professor Gregory, you were talking about the history of redlining. Right, and this emerging from lending practices that came from the Roosevelt administration's response to the housing crisis. And so for, this is for both of you. So thinking about how do you see this contemporary crisis, and Professor Gregory, you kind of talked about this at the end, but this contemporary crisis we're in with housing as emerging from the history that we've learned today in the lecture and the racialized, what are the racialized dimensions of our current housing crisis that kind of don't get as much um, airtime, but that are actually really integral for thinking about not only the effects of these um, historical, um, uh, you know, state-sponsored efforts, but also processes of gentrification today. So thinking about kind of how, how do you see this emerging from that? Thank you for reminding me why I stay awake all night long. Um, there's a lot to unpack there, um, I would say. Uh, I mean, in terms of policy making, we, we need to look at what kinds of new policies actually um, can undo some of these harms. Uh, for example, you know, there's a disproportionate number of African Americans and folks of color who are, you know, racially segregated into certain industries that have lower incomes, and so they might be more likely to be renters. And so the, co the constant conversation about how do we keep the rental prices at a stabilized uh, level so that it's just a sp stability just stability. That way we can have communities that are more consistent. In my particular community, um, we have about 42% renters, and you can imagine the churn of having to move every year because your rent goes up 10%, over 10%, over 10%. And one of the reasons why people buy homes is that your mortgage is 30 year fixed or zero if you were, enable, you were able to, to inherit it. So when you're a part of a community that um, is not able to access that you know, um, generational wealth and you're constantly renting, and even the policies like the HUD policy that um, allows you to move into subsidized housing, but how dare you have extra income because you might lose your subsidy. So you're in this hamster wheel of not being able to cycle out. Don't even think about bringing extra people in your household so you can combine your efforts, not only combine your efforts and save on resources, but save the environment. You know, <laughs> think about how those um, policies that are designed to help and create a safety net also are like the Iron Maiden. Yeah, absolutely. I mean all things that I think about all the time, so thank you. So let me add a historical dimension that I think people don't always understand. Um, for the last 40 years, we've been taught by the real estate industry especially that home, buying a home is an investment. It's a way to make money. But for generations, and especially in the 30s with the Roosevelt administration, racist though it was, the idea was you buy a home to live in. It wasn't expected to increase in value. It was just, a, you know, it was there to be used, not invested in. So this price appreciation that happens everywhere, 
is driven by an expectation, by a story. This is the way to make money. And yes, for those who play it well, it's like investing in the stock market. But that shift from a, a good that was for use to a good that was for investment is part of this nightmare. And it means there's not enough property for everyone. There's homelessness and people being, you know, renters especially, very vulnerable. And think about the ecosystem. When you have seniors who can't move out of their home and downsize into affordable um, living situations so that the next generation can buy their first home, uh, it, it creates this stopgap where folks are not able to get into the market because the market is, is completely uh, skewed at this point. Thank you both. And so now I have audience questions. Um, and so one of our high school students from Nathan Hale, um, I'm going to start with the first question. Um, they are asking if you could kind of give us a little bit more of an explanation between the difference between racial segregation and racial exclusion, really thinking about kind of, you know, the nuts and bolts of it. Well, so in cities across the country, there is and has been you know, practices of racial segregation. Cities like Chicago and New York have been historically segregated, and African Americans, and much more segregated now than our area, because gentrification has broken that up. But all along, there were black areas, as well as white areas. And so when newcomers arrived, there was some place for them to squeeze into. But a city like this and some of these West Coast cities that practiced exclusion, intentionally keeping people out, and then these housing policies that left no space, essentially, not divided by race, just no space, that's different. So especially in the West, uh, we see, and it starts with excluding Asian origin people first, Chinese immigrants and then yeah, but then it, it kind of rolls right into excluding black people. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so another historical question, um, how effective were civil rights groups and their activism um, in fighting restrictive covenants prior to 1968, prior to this federal kind of change? Was there any movement or was it really stark in Seattle? and King County, I think. Oh, yeah, so African-American activists, you know, the NAACP has had a chapter here since, I think it was like 1913 or so, one of the first chapters. NAACP and other uh, black community groups resisted, fought. Various laws were passed. They were, tended to be very weak and they weren't addressing housing in particular. So activists, including left-wingers of various racial uh, origins, uh, but especially the black community. Filipino community was quite active. In its own way, the JACL, the Japanese American Citizens League, um, worked on these things. There were, um, anybody know Mount Baker neighborhood nowadays? So Mount Baker was subdivided and restricted really early in the 20th century, and the subdivider didn't think to add race then because there weren't very many people of color around, um, but pretty quickly uh, tried to keep African Americans out, and especially Japanese people, um, and sued people for selling properties, but um, activists would keep trying to move in and in the 1930s, the community club, Mount Baker Community Association, also tried to get the city to stop Japanese Americans from using the park, the public park on Lake Washington, and demanded that the city park service keep Japanese people out. But so the act of pressing for homes in areas was a very brave thing to do. Individuals did it, communities supported that. Um, it, you know, as those incidents I told you, it was dangerous to be the only person trying to move into one of those, but people did it. So all along, there are great stories of, you know, the efforts, and then some of these efforts 
were very well organized, especially in the 60s. Um, so I'm going to ask an audience question and kind of add mine on because I'd love to hear um, Representative Taylor's um, take on this. So um, the historical one is how does, Seattle, how does Seattle's history of restrictive covenants compare to that in other cities outside of Washington state? But then I'd love to hear more about Representative Taylor when you talked in the beginning about uh, this being um, something that other places are taking up. So kind of thinking about not only the um, harms that are kind of broad, but also some of these reparative justice work being done that is sparked by your work. Well, I'm not a historian, I'm just the daughter of one. <laughs> well, you're looking at the pioneer here. There are states that have seen this law and they're thinking about it. I think Nevada, the legislature just voted authorized the two universities to conduct the kind of study mm -hmm. that our legislature authorized three years ago. It, they're not doing anything about it yet, but you can see they're, they're, they're reading, they're, they're following, they know. Yeah. The story about HB 1474 is, is moving and it's gonna make a big difference. And, I, and as we were going through the process, um, Massachusetts was looking at um, a similar effort, and um, they said, no, you go first. So, <laughs> uh, the, so the states are really watching, they're advocates who are in alignment with us. I mean, uh, one of the things that was very quite interesting in this work is it didn't take two, but two seconds for someone to send a note into us saying, this is reparations. Yeah. It is. <laughs> but it's reparative justice, which is really what we're trying to get at. It, it is how do we repair the harms? How do we move into a more inclusive economic future? How do we ensure that we don't make these same mistakes over and over and over again? And, and, and I'll go back to the policy making. Um, just today, we're um, in, in discussion, if you will, about policies that um, may benefit some homeowners in terms of um, weatheriza weatherization, adding solar panels, things that could theoretically add value to your home um, if you have the, the cash value to, or the cash on hand, because there's a lot of folks who are very, very cash poor in their homes, to make those upgrades. And then when you're ready to sell if you, or if you need to leverage for a second more mortgage or for whatever purpose, your value is higher because you've made these upgrades. A lot of black families, this is one thing we have to look at, maybe the, um, the next iteration of this um, project and uh, this act would be, how do we help existing homeowners who were somehow able to survive these racially restrictive covenants and purchase a home but haven't been able to make the upgrades because of all the systems that were in place that kept them from Key, um, uh, improving the values of the home. And, and, and we've already seen it where even in Seattle, someone can um, you know, put their house up for sale, get it evaluated, but if they have all the trinkets and, and you know, uh, ideology and, and pictures and stuff of their black family, the evaluator with their subconscious bias perhaps, and sometimes direct you know, bias, um, creates um, a lower home um, value. So we've even looked at legislation that would ensure that there's training for um, and education for professionals working in the industry so that we can reduce the amount of bias. So it's not just about the, um, the, the harm that is happening and, and the repair in that specific thing is making sure that we have those other policies that will support and sustain this effort, sustain the effort. Absolutely. Um, Professor Gregory, you mentioned that black people were not allowed to live in North Seattle, but one of the maps showed black people living in almost every district, even if it was very low numbers. And so this audience member is asking, how, how did that happen? Were they mostly domestic servants or were they kind of people who, as you just mentioned, were able to kind of um, go through a lot of obstacles to get a home there? Yeah, so uh, the data we use doesn't give us quite the picture we want. The chances are that many of those numbers refer to people who have live-in jobs as domestic servants. Um, that would have been the safest way to be living in one of those neighborhoods. Uh, but there were, you know, I gave you an example of people who managed, and especially 
you know, it, by the 1950s, um, there are more and more pioneers, they were called. They, literally, that was the term being used. The pioneer, go be the only black family in that neighborhood. Um, but people were doing it. So little numbers like that, uh, and also people who are working in homes. And so the final question I have is, I'm gonna read the audience one and then I have another like kind of tag on. Um, so are there any examples of legal cases brought by white people against their white neighbors who sold property to black people despite the restrictive covenants? So thinking about like kind of that was a potential, the violence was a potential um, and did it happen? And then this makes me think the law is so important in so many of these stories that we, and also Thinking about the current the um, current uh, House bill, the law like you you mentioned a number of times that you're doing it as tort uh, claim, right? And so for our audience, if you could explain what why why that makes that different and why that kind of perhaps gives it more legal, um, uh, I guess uh, not coverage, but oh, a yeah. strategy, a legal yes. strategy, legal strategy. There you go. Yes. You don't want me to start with that? Yeah, you do. <laughs> well, the legal strategy is to connect the harm specifically to um, the individual who is harmed. And so it, it, one of the, the most significant challenges with reparations is, um, well, when did your family get here? Or do you qualify? Or, you know, um, uh, our, you weren't in our state, in Mississippi, so therefore, um, you know, you shouldn't get any compensation. There's just a whole host of things that happen in the reparations conversation, and I, I, there's a lot of discussions. New York State just um, established its first uh, statewide reparations uh, work group to address this issue. I know um, Washington may be interested in establishing one, I think, a gu gubernatorial one. Uh, Seattle has um, a work group that they have formed informally. City of Ev Evanston, Illinois, there's, there's a lot of um, interest in actually going headlong into the reparations discussion. How do you implement a program? How do you, um, what, is it a cash payment? Is it a, a program or a structure? Who's eligible? When we're thinking about a person who's, you know, black, um, for example, um, you know, what happens if your family immigrated here for reasons that are around uh, refugee status, and yet you're you're still impacted by, quote unquote, the, the war on drugs, and and so how do you repair the harm in the criminal legal system when the, all those things happen? And so the, every system's connected to another system, connected to another system, and finding a way to. Uh, um, address the problem f f with specificity that allows us to actually do something. And then, of course, there are people who just simply want to write the check and walk away and think that that's going to change structures, and that doesn't necessarily, but I'm up for the conversation. I'm up for the conversation and see how we build something. Great. Thank you. And I've forgotten what you asked. Oh, um, the, the, uh, any legal cases of um, white neighbors suing their neighbors if they sold them to a black family? Um, so there, actually, I think we have not found any enforcement lawsuits. Uh, you know, that Mount Baker thing where the developer was suing families, there wasn't actually a restriction there. And so the, the families who are being sued won. Um, it's a little different, but it's, it's kind of the reverse of what you're asking. Uh, but it's one of those cases that really is very revealing. So in 19, many, most of the cemeteries restricted on the basis of race. Uh, Wasili Cemetery up there in particular. And in 1960, a black couple lost their son, three years old, in a swimming pool accident. And they tried to get a burial plot in Wasili. Uh, and by then, the state actually had an anti-discrimination law. It wasn't specifically about restrictive covenants, but it said discrimination is against the race, discrimination is against the law. So they then go there. And Wasili um, sued them to block uh, 
uh, their effort, or may, they sued, I forget who sued whom. But in any case, they simply want to bury their child. And the cemetery says no, because of the restrictive covenant. It goes to the Supreme Court of Washington State. And the Supreme Court threw out the anti-discrimination law that the legislature had passed. And one of the judges said, it's unconstitutional because it interferes with the right to segregate. That's 1960. Yeah, I mean, our Supreme Court upheld the racially restrictive covenants in 1961. Um, what I would say in terms of like thinking about the Supreme Court of the United States, they um, uh, ruled against the universities on affirmative action, but now under question will be legacy admissions. I mean, that affects the University of Washington, it affects all Harvard, all these schools that have historically been able to admit their students through a connection to the school. And if, if they've been racially discriminatory in the past, that, that system, that legacy admission is something they may not be able to stand. So they might have done something that actually helps <laughs> equity in ways that they didn't, maybe they didn't contemplate. Um, and, and so it's, it's just interesting to see where the law is gonna go. Um, in particular, you probably didn't see very many of those cases because you have to have this uh, concept called standing. Um, are you the person who was harmed by it? So bringing a case as a white person against another white person, uh, how are you impacted by their transaction? And so those are a little bit harder to um, navigate in the court system. So you want to have the person who would have been um, discriminated against in those particular cases. Of, so I think that, you know, Time is now to test out every theory and see how far we can get. Um, you know, the, the civil rights movement was not just about the activists who are um, on the, the picket lines. There are folks who are in the courts fighting in the legal system and, and ensuring that the courts were upholding their part of the bargain as well. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you both so much. Thank you.